Now, back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. Welcome back to the program. We're talking disability insurance on this episode of The Law Show this morning. Our guests in studio, Joel Murphy and Derek Ma from Murphy Batista LLP, a personal injury firm in downtown Vancouver in the Scotia Tower at Georgia and Granville and online at murphybatista.com. Disability insurance um, is one of the reasons that, uh, Derek, that uh, insurance, uh, insurance companies in the disability business are so reluctant to pay because of fraud. We hear this. We hear this. We see it in the papers. Well, you know, insurance premiums are going up because those fraudsters out there, they're ripping us off left, right, and center, so we're going to charge you more for your disability insurance, and we're going to give you a really hard time when you make a claim because you, too, may be a fraud artist out there to rip us off. Yep, and that certainly is a problem. I'll tell you a story that uh, I went through when I was doing the defense work on disability claims. Okay. And it's an interesting story, and I do still tell it to my clients to this day, is uh, there was a health professional who had made a disability claim. And at her examination for discovery, which is a question and answer period under oath, if you're expected to tell the truth, she said, you won't understand this, um, but it was my pelvis is out of alignment. The reality is I can't be on all fours. I can't give horsey back rides to my little kids, and she started to break down in tears. Right. So this is what happened at her discovery. Um, we had surveillance video of her, and she had been at her, her clinic, and she was first in the parking lot and cutting down the landscaping and loading them in the back of her SUV. Didn't look like she had too much pain doing that, but that's fine. Okay. And then she went off to the gas station, and after dumping all the landscaping, and she was inside the back of her SUV, vacuuming on all fours. Okay. So exactly what she said she could not do to give horsey back ride. She was doing that um, for probably a good 20, 25 minutes. No expressions of pain in her face, that sort of stuff. So that's a big problem, and that's why I think disability insurers one of the reasons why they take the approach they do. Right. Well, and I mean, and we've talked about this, Joe Murphy, in terms of ICBC in, in previous episodes as well. I mean, fraud does occur when you've got this big fat cat multi-gazillion dollar company out there with more money in the basement than you can ever dream about. Why not take a shot at ripping them off? And, and so they have departments responsible for fraud and all the rest of it. But is it really... Uh, at the volume that they would have us believe that justifies this attitude about really being so reluctant to pay claims. Sterling, I had a trial where one of the witnesses called by ICBC was one of their investigators, and this is one of the senior investigators, and his evidence that he gave under oath to the jury is that fraud costs ICBC and the premium payers like you and me $450 million a year. So I got up and I said, sir, $450 million a year. He said, yeah. I said, tell us where that is. That's a lot of money. Where, where is it? Well, we don't know. Okay. I said, what studies has ICBC done to determine where this fraud is, the $450 million? Well, we haven't done any studies. I said, what studies are underway to deal with this huge annual loss that, that costs everybody? Well, we don't have any studies underway. I said, well, okay, well, given the amount we're dealing with, what studies have been suggested to ICBC that should be done to identify and hopefully address this? And he said, well, there aren't any. So and he made it up. Yeah, I, I said to him, I said, so you just made up this number. Huh. And he said, well, no, the Insurance Bureau of Canada says 15% of all claims paid are fraudulent, and we pay out X, what is it? $6 billion a year or $4 billion, whatever the number is, and 15% is 450 So yeah. that's that's where it is. And I said, you just made it up. Because if ICBC really thought it was losing that much money every year, it would be looking at how to solve the You'd problem. You'd have to think so. And you're telling me they're not. So come on. And Anyways, I, I don't think the jury believed them. It is a problem. People set out to to cheat ICBC, and that affects every one of us who pays premiums. You get people who stage accidents. Oh, yeah, yeah. You get people who are strangely, suspiciously in, you know, 15 accidents and sometimes involving the same group of other people. Those are all suspicious. But there's also cases where ICBC sets out to shortchange or cheat someone. And, and I'll give you an example. If I'm injured and I go into the ICBC on the first visit after an accident, they'll say, well, you've got to fill out these forms. And one of the things you have to do is you have to sign the form that says, we get all your medical records. 
for as long as long as far back as we want so to this, go. So this is compulsory then. Well, that's what these people that's are what they told, tell you. That's and what they the answer tell you. is it's not. Oh. Um, if a person's dealing directly with ICBC before the claim is settled, ICBC does an internal review of what a claim is worth. So let's say they assume the claim's worth five thousand mm-hmm. dollars. They're going to offer the person two thousand or twenty-two fifty. They, they will sometimes have gotten a report from the person's doctor, and the adjuster might say, "Well, you know, your doctor said this, therefore we'll offer you twenty-two fifty." And the person says, "Well, can I see the doctor's report?" And commonly the adjuster says, "Oh, I'm not allowed to show you that." Well, that's not true. It's about you. So, you know, um, the system works. It works well. But the idea that there's this huge fraud out there, I, I just don't buy. Okay. Um, and the idea that there's there's fraud or dishonesty out there, I agree that's there. Of but course. But it's on both sides. Right. Because, you know, people uh, are unrepresented and they deal with adjusters and they're often or sometimes told things that simply aren't true. And and the cases that an adjuster might think is worth twenty five thousand uh, dollars might be settled for eight thousand or ten thousand or twelve thousand, because that's what the adjuster is able to negotiate. Sure, sure. Uh, all the while knowing the claim is worth twenty five thousand. So you know, yeah, it's a problem. Everybody has to be on the lookout for it. Um, ICBC needs to watch carefully, and they've got they've brought in a whole bunch of different programs. They used to. If your car was stolen and then recovered, you got to keep the salvage. And what people were then doing is stripping their cars, reporting it stolen. Right, right. They they get their car back, a big payout, and then they pull all the parts out and put it back on. So that was a good good rule for ICBC to make. We're sure. not going to give you the salvage. And there's a variety of other ones. Um, it's a problem, but it's not the problem that's often described by the insurance company. Right. Now, Derek, you have the advantage in this conversation of having worked for the other team. Uh, you uh, represent, or you were a part of coming out of law school. You were retained by a major Vancouver corporate law firm whose clients include major corporate insurance companies. So you know their playbook, and you know the platoons of lawyers these companies are capable of hiring. And a lot of the, the, those lawyers' times is spent on devising reasons not to pay claims, correct? Absolutely. Any reason that you can come up with not to pay a claim and to justify it, that's what you're trying to do. And I think that's one of the things that we as lawyers acting for plaintiffs now really need to focus on is how do we start to really punish these insurance companies for making those decisions simply to deny benefits to save money. And I think reason. I don't know even, gentlemen, that that many people are aware of the fact that disability companies are major, major corporations who exist to well serve their shareholders. Make a profit. That's right, and make a profit. So you know anything you can do to accelerate or or increase the profit margin is a bonus time for everybody involved. So the more they can do to discourage the payment of disability claims, Derek, the more money they have to throw around and party with. No, that's absolutely true. And I think one of the things that going back to how do you deter that is there's something called punitive damages. That is how you get your money for what you're entitled to under the policy, but it's a separate set of money that the court awards you to say, disability company, you shouldn't have done that. Right. That's behavior that is in bad faith, um, that you should not have engaged in, and so we're going to give the plaintiff an additional sum sum of money to compensate for that. And that's really the big deterrent, I think, moving forward. Right. And, Joe, you've spoken uh, quite uh, eloquently in the past about how uh, some of these charades go on and on, and, and insurance companies just will do bend over backwards, fall over backwards, not to pay someone where clearly they should they should have made the payment. So uh, this kind of, of reluctance is, that's that's the way business is done, isn't it? Well, you can look at it that they're an insurance company and that, but when you buy disability insurance, it's a special kind of insurance, and there's a court uh, in dealing with a disability insurance uh, claim that said, you know, this is a peace of mind policy. If I buy disability insurance, it's d- designed that if I can't work and can't support my family, we'll have money coming in so that the bills will be paid. Absolutely. That's so why we pay it. Yeah. So it's a special kind of insurance, and it's supposed to give me the peace of mind once I have it and I paid the premium that if something bad happens, I can rely on the insurance company to pay the benefits. Right. And when something bad happens and a person can't work, yet the insurance company, who knows, 
and you just look at the file and every uh, letter from a doctor says this person cannot work, they know they can't work and they still don't pay. Um, they're just out to save money. They're out to, you know, the, the effect is to just beat this person down over time. And if these people don't go and see a lawyer, they walk away thinking, well, there's nothing I can do. Um, and that's really, that's really tragic because these people were entitled to it. They had the policy, they had the right policy, but they just got paid by an insurance company that had lots of reports saying they can't work, but thought, no, we're just not going to pay them. So, Mr. Linden, so I was going to add an important point to that is to know when to see a lawyer as well, because we've got the statute of limitations, which puts um, two years on a negligence claim to sue someone. Right. Um, but a lot of these disability policies have their own limitation date in there. It could be one year from the date of when the disability starts. So ah. it, don't always assume it's a two-year limit. It will have its own limitation date in there. So when then is a good time in, in the context of a disability claim, Derek, to contact a lawyer. I mean, we talked in terms of, I remember last month we talked about uh, car accidents, and if you're banged up in a car accident, then you should consult a lawyer. In many cases, if you call Joe or at Murphy Batista or one of your colleagues, you'll be told, hey, you really don't need a lawyer, but here's what you do need to do, and good luck solving your claim, and if you have any real problems, call us back. Is it the same type of protocols with disability, or is it is it a kind of a harsher uh, jurisdiction to deal in? I would say absolutely sooner is better because in disability insurance as well, there may be and there usually are clauses in the policy which make you apply for other benefits before you can even enjoy these benefits. It may be EI, it may be Canada Pension Plan. Oh. And if you even get accepted for those benefits, they get integrated into what benefits you have now. So really important to go through the policy with a lawyer to really understand what your obligations are because you do need to do certain things to satisfy the policy to prove your claim, prove your disability to the insurance company. So, Joe, when then is a good time to get involved with a lawyer or to get a lawyer involved in your life when you're in the process of being, well, you're filing a disability claim and not getting much satisfaction afterwards? Yeah, the, the start... Uh, Sterling, it's just a phone call to the, the law firm, and in 10 minutes, sometimes we can solve the problem or say, you better come in and see us. Um, but the starting point is a phone call. There are there are just things that uh, are you know unique or different about it. T total disability. Doctors have to understand what that means if they're going to uh, fill out any form or write a report, and doctors aren't trained to understand what total disability and insurance and a disability insurance policy means. Have you ever had a call from a doctor who says, "Look, I've got this form. I have this 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 patient that I you know I can see is really messed up, but I've got this form and these questions, and I I don't I don't understand the questions. I don't want to answer them wrongly. Yeah. I want to support my my patient. What do I do? Have yeah. you ever had those calls? Well, the, the more common call is the doctor saying, I've got a patient who should be getting benefits and isn't, and I don't understand why because I've written again and again saying they can't oh, work. Oh, okay. So the docs sometimes the, call they you. They need some help. Okay. Uh, because when, when a doctor is asked to fill out a form and it deals with total disability, they think they know what it means. Right. Um, but the reality is unless they're experienced with that or someone's briefed them on, listen, it doesn't mean bedridden. Um, they just don't know there's confusion there. They don't know when asked when is the total disability going to end that they can write in unknown into that box, and that's that's okay. Um, so it's a, it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma for the person making the claim. It's a dilemma for the doctors who are trying to f understand what they need to say in a report that addresses the issue that needs to be uh, addressed. So, Derek, the, the, the sooner the better. Uh, sooner the you, better. If you get a claim denied that you feel, wait a second here, now this, this should not be denied, yeah. that's the time to call a lawyer? Well, absolutely, but sooner the better because, like I said before, there is a difference between any occupation and own occupation. So in the beginning, usually most policies say you have to be disabled from your own occupation and then after two years, it changes to any occupation. So the threshold changes. Mm -hmm. It's a harder threshold later down the road. But if you get denied earlier on, that should be an easier threshold to meet. Okay. So the sooner the better. Sooner the better. Uh, you get that denial letter. Uh, get get on to Murphy Batista right away. Absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. We'll take a quick break here, and we'll come back. We're talking disability insurance on this episode of The Law Show with lots more still to accomplish. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> 
There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CIO 650.